Welcome to episode 99 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro podcast. This is a show about Office 365, Azure, and the IT Pro and end user side of life, where we discuss a topic or recent news related to Office 365 or Azure and how it relates to you as an IT Pro. I'm Scott, and in this episode, I sit down with Vlad Katnarescu from Valo Intranet to talk about Office 365 and how you can interact with it through PowerShell. Scott Hogue, back at Microsoft Ignite. It is winding down towards the last days, and I was able to pull one of my kind of hero MVPs <laughs> out to a session on the side to talk about probably one of our most or more distinct IT Pro topics this week. And that's going to be using a little bit of Posh or, or PowerShell to interact with Office 365 services. So I have Vlad here with me, and I'm going to let him do a quick intro, and then we'll get into our conversation. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Vlad Katrinescu. I work as a product evangelist at a company called Valo Intranet, and I also create content for those of you who are on Plural Site, which is an online on-demand training site. I have a few courses on there. Just a few. Just a few. For 13 now as we record, but 14 for sure by the time you're going to release it because I have a new one coming out next Monday. Oh, awesome. What's the new one on? It's migrating to Office 365 or SharePoint Online using the Microsoft tools. So oh, using uh, so PowerShell. Gotcha. <laughs> PowerShell or the new migration tool to actually migrate file shares or SharePoint content without using any third-party tool. Oh, perfect. We might have to talk about that another time. When it comes to email, Outlook and Office 365 are fantastic. But sometimes there are things you'd like to do that aren't implemented. Sperry Software creates Outlook add-ins and Office 365 services that fill in these gaps. For instance, there are Outlook add-ins to automatically print emails and or attachments, save emails to PDF, send out recurring emails, or how about a warning when you're going to do a reply to all instead of a normal reply? Find these and many more email productivity solutions. Get started today by visiting www.sperrysoftware.com slash cloud IT. Let's get through what we were here to talk about today. Uh, so I thought it'd be really fun and you know, thank you for agreeing to come on to talk about some of the interactions that go on, particularly when we think about automation and sometimes not even automation. Like We just want to light up features across these various workloads in Office 365. You know, we see a, uh, a great new thing like Hub Sites comes out and you go in and you start looking around and clicking and where the heck is the button? Uh, the button is on your desktop in a CLI. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about kind of the various interactions that we can have with PowerShell, so some of the modules that are out there, uh, how to go about uh, getting them and, and maybe getting them loaded up and how we can connect and do various accounts. So awesome. kind of start, start with that one. Yeah, sure. So like you said, PowerShell is not only for automation inside of Office 365, even for management tasks, stuff you have to do day to day, you're going to, you have no choice to learn it. Uh, there's multiple modules, and almost every service in Office 365 now has their own module. You have Exchange has their own module, Skype for Business, Teams have their own module, SharePoint has one official module, and they also have another module by the community called the SharePoint PNP or Patterns and Practices, Patterns, practices yep. module. Uh, and Power Apps and Flow are the latest ones to have an official PowerShell module right now. It's still pretty basic, but it's starting to get there. Uh, most of those are on the PowerShell gallery. For those of you IT pros who don't know, the PowerShell gallery is a central repository where Microsoft and the community publish PowerShell modules. So you can go there, you can see if there's anything for you, or you might already find a link from somebody who posted it on a blog. And the really cool thing is, if you're on Windows 10, which I hope most of you IT pros are <laughs> today, the only thing you have to do, once you have the name, the alias of the module, you open up PowerShell, install dash module, name of the module, and you automatically install it. Yep. So it's really easy to do it if you want to update it, update module, name of the module. And now, even since last month, the SharePoint team also put the official SharePoint module on the PowerShell gallery. They did, and, and that was really nice to see because we used to have a number of interactions to 
potentially get that tooling loaded up. You know, we had to go and download the Microsoft services, online sign-in assistant, RTW yeah. version 34 <laughs> FBQ. And, you know, it had to be the right incantation of it. And then we had to go install the SharePoint module on top of it and then potentially keep those in lockstep or up to date as we were kind of going through. And, and now it's just one interaction. It because yeah. you had to actually go and open up control panel, uninstall the old one, go to the download center, uh, re-download it and install it. So it was a pain finished by not that many people were actually doing it. Everybody was like, I'll use an old version until it breaks or there's actually a, <laughs> a command that is not there, not There's there. some fix that I need to put in. And, and now we can be a little bit more evergreen with that. And because we've done install module just straight from PS Gallery, we can just do things like update module yeah. and go ahead and force those in on a, on a more regular cadence and, and push them in. For some of those workloads, so... SharePoint and Power Apps and Flow and things like that. Yeah, we, we have the modules in the gallery. Some of the other products have adopted the PowerShell remoting principles. Yeah. Uh, so if we look at workloads, ex Exchange is probably one of the biggest ones that comes to mind. Yep. So yeah, for, for Exchange, and for Exchange, it really depends. If you're not using multi-factor authentication, and I don't want to get too deep into the topic, but if you have global admin access, please use multi-factor authentication. <laughs> you don't want to be the next company on the front page of the news that got hacked. So please, if you have admin access in 365, use MFA. But if you don't use it, you don't even need to download a module. You just need to do a new PS session. There's a few parameters you have to give, such as the credential, a URL, a authentication basic. You import the PS session, and you basically have the latest command looks every time that you connect. So you're almost always, you're always up to date because you get them every time you connect. For, if you use MFA, and this is the same thing for Exchange and for the Compliance Center, because Exchange and the Compliance Center are really tight-knit together, so it works the same way with MFA and without MFA. So if you use multi-factor authentication, you actually have to go in the admin center. In exchange, you have a hybrid at the bottom. I don't know why they put it under hybrid. That's a topic for another day. But you go <laughs> under hybrid, and then you can download the exchange PowerShell module from there. And it's really funny that you can only download it in IE. If you download it via Chrome, you're going to get a random error. Then you're going to Google it, and you're going to like, okay, the general... Application cannot be run. Please contact your administrator. And you spend one hour just finding out that even Edge is not supported. You have to use IE to download that module, install it the first time, then you're good to go. And then you have just a different command line. It's connect EXO PS session to connect to Exchange Online with MFA. It's an interesting thing, and I think more people are going to be hit with some downstream impacts. So Microsoft has done a couple things on the Azure AD side, particularly with bringing baseline conditional access policies for administrative accounts. So service administrators, not just global admins, but service admins for Exchange and SharePoint. There's going to be a default policy, and it's a good thing. It's the baseline MFA policy that's going to light up. And if you're not on MFA today for those types of accounts, you're going to be walked through that process. And that's not to say that, you know, as a customer, you still shouldn't have maybe dedicated service accounts or kind of break glass accounts because we, we still need those things and that's okay, but they're locked down in different ways and they have other things going on. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too, depending on the, the business process and the cycle that you have. So it, it is a little bit interesting for how we connect and kind of consume services. And then some of them are a little bit weird too. I've noticed with things like Flow and Power Apps, it's not just having access yeah. to the module <laughs> and it's not just having access to a, a global admin account or a service admin account. It's having access to licensing as well. So now we've got this mix match of technology, what's installed on my machine, what type of user am I? And Oh, by the way, do I have an entitlement? Some of the modules, especially the, the Power Apps and Flow and Teams, are really, in my opinion at least, not there yet. And like you said, Power Apps, you need, Power Apps and Flow, you need to have access to a whole lot of things to be able to effectively manage it. If we look at Teams, for example, it has one huge limitation. Even if you're a global admin, 
and you use you connect to teams using PowerShell, you can only manage the groups that you're an owner of. So that, that would be a very big limitation. <laughs> uh, so if you're not a member of that group, you don't even see it when you do get team, which shows you all of the teams. You only see the ones that you're an owner of that you can manage. So that's really weird because teams are supposed to be only people that work on the project, on that team. You don't want to have random service accounts in each team because people see them, they show up. Especially when we think about that manifestation of groups with yeah. email and other workloads sitting in the background because you know groups in Azure AD construct with a mailbox and a SharePoint wow, site and all, well, these, yeah. all these other things. You know, it's kind of like yeah. calm groups, but it's really all this other stuff on the back end. Yeah, you don't want just random global admins who have access to potentially oh. all those messages. We, you know, we'd still want to drive that through like e-discovery and formal yeah. process. Yeah. And there's definitely some things. And then one of the ones I've noticed as well is not all of the teams that are the product groups that, that develop these PowerShell modules follow the same conventions. So, so, you know, we think about like, you know, verbs and nouns and there's little things like you go into like power apps and I forget the exact, you know, command line, but there's like get app or something. And it's, but it's not like get power app app. It's, yeah, just, it's get just get app. app. And then you're, well, which module am I targeting? And do you have duplication? Are you actually having to like strongly name and, and get into what you need? Yeah, not, unfortunately, not all of the product groups follow the best practices. And that becomes a bit tough for people that come from the power, PowerShell world as sysadmins that don't necessarily know teams or don't know power apps and they have to manage them now. When they try to discover things, when you don't follow the same naming convention as the rest, yep. it becomes hard to discover. And even the exchange team, when you actually import the module in SharePoint as well, you get a warning like, hey, some of the verbs, some of the command locks in this module don't follow standard naming convention. Make sure you use get command to actually see all of them. So there is definitely some of them that are a bit uh, weird. Uh, there's even my favorite one that I like, love to make fun of is when you do get SPO external user in SharePoint Online, there's one parameter that is the longest parameter that you've ever seen. It's like, Show only account when invited account do not match. <laughs> so it's really like this, like takes half of the screen only for one single parameter. Yeah, and you just so, wonder sometimes, so like, like, what's the output? An alias and... guys or something like that. Give me, give me something else to make it easier. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a little bit weird, and and sometimes I get a little bipolar about it. Like you don't know what you're landing in based on one module to the next. You, I, I do a lot with Azure, and they've broken some conventions over there where lots of the commandlets just return raw JSON instead of objects. So you're, you're looking at things, you're like, well, yes, I could convert it and I could put it back into an object and type it. And uh, it's just, yeah. it's a little bit strange depending on how you walk in. Um, uh, I'll, go other... off, I'll go off topic a bit, talking about yeah. JSON. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> so, something that I've seen recently that changed is that uh, when Microsoft released, for example, column formatting or things like that, I'm like, hey, this is a tool for end users. Everybody's <laughs> going to be able to do it. It's yeah, this be super is no easy. code, except it's and code. This is no code. And they're like, yeah, you only have to know how to write JSON. <laughs> and even as an IT pro, I can understand JSON. You give me a file, I'll be able to manipulate it. I understand it. But don't ask me to write raw JSON for anything. It's not something that I think... A lot of IT pros don't know how to do it. Imagine the users from the HR department that want to add some uh, formatting. Yeah, you need to have something to get you there and kind of have a linter. Yeah, yeah you know, I need like Emmet for, 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 you know, what I'm driving into. They actually had some announcements about that this week yeah, where the, the, they've the UI simpli version. simplified that experience. They've gone from what they called no code to what I would deem no code, no code yeah. uh, to go ahead and, and kind of simplify that experience. Mover is a cloud migration company that specializes in moving your company's files from file servers or cloud storage like Box, Dropbox, and Google into Office 365. Their patented technology makes Mover the fastest OneDrive file migrator in the world. Moving dozens of terabytes of data a day is a breeze. Use Mover's free, industry-leading migration guides or ask for a managed migration and they'll take the lead. With Mover, all your data is secure and intact. 
running completely behind the scenes, you don't lose time, money, or hair while you transfer. Scan, plan, migrate, report. Migrations that don't suck with Mover. Visit mover.io for more info. One of the other things I wanted to make sure we touched on as well was not just the various consumption mechanisms that we have for all these different modules, but also that you might find things in different places. So thinking about a workload like something like groups, groups doesn't have a dedicated module. And, and most people, you know, we hear about it a lot in the context of SharePoint. You know, your first place to look might be, hey, I got the SharePoint module. How do I manage a group site or how do I I manage a group? It's all over. Groups is one of the worst examples because it contains so many different services where for the teams part of that group, you need a team module. For uh, the mailbox, you need exchange. Even for the membership, you can do it in either exchange or Azure AD. And now it becomes really weird because it used to be only exchange. So you'd have the get unified group. Yeah, we would go the ahead. Unified we'd, we'd group do import links, PS session, and everything yep. was in exchange. And now in the new Azure AD V2 module, you can have those operations on groups as well. But some of them, for example, the, viewing the, re- the deleted groups. If you want to see the Office 365 group recycle bin, those are only in the Azure AD V2 preview module mm-hmm. for now. So it really depends on what you want to do. You have to go into many different modules. And that's where, where it becomes important for even a SharePoint Online admin, if you only used to manage SharePoint Online before, to gather knowledge and to learn the different services in 365, like Exchange. Even if you're not going to administer it on a day-to-day basis and you're not going to do mail traces and change DNS records for the email, you're going to need to learn how to manage that group mailbox, that group membership. You have to understand the workloads and and where they come from on the back end. And it's not so much that, you know, nobody's saying you can't be an exchange expert anymore. You can't be just a SharePoint thing. Like, we all have to have things that we're good at. But you have to be, like, knowledgeable and at least understand all these other ancillary services to be able to tie all those together or at least have the conversation. You know, if you're the SharePoint guy, but you know that there's something with mailboxes and you're not an exchange administrator, so you you don't have access to that service and you can't connect with PowerShell, you've got to be friends with the person in the organization (laughs) who is and, and, and be able to go over to them and say, hey, I'm trying to do this. Do we have these entitlements? Do, can we light up these features? Can, can we, turn this thing on? Because you have all these just different requirements. Sometimes I need to be a global admin to light up a service. Sometimes I need to be a service admin. Sometimes I need to be both, depending on you know how the wind is blowing that yeah, day. Yeah, that's where we're going to, as IT pros, we're going to have a job forever. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Everybody thinks they're going away, but yeah, they're, they're just no, changing a little bit. There's more job than ever. <laughs> they, they, they are not going anywhere. What else do you think is important for kind of people to know about some of these PowerShell workloads? So things like groups, you know, being hidden out there. I think the Azure AD V2 module, like that's kind of a hidden gem. You have to know it's out there, especially when it comes to managing Active Directory tenant features. Again, one of the ones I would think about with Office 365 would be like naming policies for groups. You know, I've got to have the right licensing and then I'm going to drive that out of that V2 module. All, are there any all kind of, of those groups, all of like, even the guest policies, they are in Azure V2. If you want to set what groups can have external users, what groups cannot, all of that is in there. SharePoint is one that has a ton of hidden properties that you can set only with PowerShell, especially at securing the tenant. Now with the new admin center is a lot better, but do a get SPO tenant on the tenant so you can see all of the properties that you can change. And you're going to find a ton of security properties there that you can actually modify to actually make it to secure a tenant a bit more. And also for reporting. So one of my sessions this week was a three must-have reports in PowerShell for Office 365. And I kind of showed a lot of things that you cannot do via the user interface. For example, getting all of the external users in SharePoint mm-hmm. Online. You don't have a report out of the box for that in 365. And it's kind of an important feature to know which external people have access to your Thanks. And I think, you know, reporting is a kind of a, a good one to get into, too, because you have a number of canned thing use, usage reports. There's usage analytics, which is tied into kind of Power BI and, and exports of kind of audit and security logs and a couple other things. But 
it's not an area that is set in stone. There are just things that we have to do as consumers and customers of, of, of Microsoft to recognize that, hey, I might need to do a little bit more work to get at the data that's meaningful to me or my organization. So that's another one where you have to know where the data is. Does, yeah. it, does it sit in exchange or is it part of the unified audit log? Or do I need to go and enumerate a directory and understand sign-ins or, or some other part of the platform that, that got pushed out? <laughs> Talk about a unified audit log. Now that we have that in 365, it's a gold mine of information. All, all the information what people do in Office 365 is in there, including what IP did they sign up from, what files did they view, all the things like that, even admin activities. What I've seen a customer do is they use PowerShell actually to get information from the unified audit log because you can consume it from there by, from PowerShell. Yep. Put it in a SQL database in Azure and then create Power BI reports on it. So all of their analytics about sites, about groups, about last access stuff all over the place resides on the unified audit log, PowerShell. And you can even do really cool security things like, hey, I have Scott that logged in at the same day from the US and from China in a four hour difference. Yeah. So then I can add that logic using reports, using even PowerShell to be like, hey, there might be something wrong there. <laughs> yeah, so, so you can drive all that. And, and I don't know that it's always apparent to administrators of the platform that because we're driving all that identity through Azure Active Directory, we can also go interrogate things like sign-in logs there. And those can be very... Well, I mean, they can be very rich. So, so there's a couple of things that happen there. Is there again, there's built-in kind oh, yeah. of canned reports, and you can certainly go in and kind of roll your own or pull your own out. I think the other thing that was interesting in what you just said too is you mentioned you know that customer that goes out and uh, enumerates those logs and interrogates them, pulls them down, and puts them in SQL. That buys them the benefit of having additional retention as well and controlling how long that data is there. So it's not just modeling the data, but there's sometimes downsides or limitations to using the out of the box Microsoft services where oh yeah, it only uh, keeps hey, it for 90 days. Hey, it's it's going to and it's it's going to roll over and it's going to yeah. be gone. So if I need it longer than that, it's on me as a customer and a consumer to go pull it down, find a place to put it and, and save it yeah, in whatever <laughs> and, database and, system that you want. I've seen people save it in Oracle. I'm a big uh, SQL fan because there's a module for SQL. So it's easy using PowerShell to just Get it using the exchange module, even if it's the unified audit log. And that's one, uh, another thing that you said, you need to know where everything is. You would think that the unified audit log is in the compliance center module. No, it's <laughs> you the would, exchange you think, module. You, you would Why think. make it easy? Uh, but yeah, that, use the SQL PowerShell module to dump it in a SQL server. And it's only a few lines of PowerShell. Yeah, and, and I think that's the beauty of that, is once you understand where these things are, you can not only enable services, but as you're learning to enable them and tweak them and pull this data down, it becomes a kind of central tenant to automation and, and, and ongoing. So, you know, it's not necessarily going to be that right once thing. You might actually want to save your scripts and store them someplace where the team can have access to them and kind of treat them as, as more formal artifacts that can follow a life cycle. Scripts are code now. Are they? <laughs> no, okay, so no, scripts are not code. Let, let me rephrase that. No, no, scripts, I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, code, I was being sarcastic. From a it's... storage perspective, now that we rely on PowerShell more than ever for reports, for automation, even for provisioning, scripts, I think, should be stored in a Visual Studio, should have a repository in GitHub, or have all of the features that we used to treat code with. Check it in, save it, other people can collaborate on it. So I don't think it's just scripts that should stay on on our D drive like we used to do before and run them on a scheduled task from Windows. No, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of going out and letting everybody know that there needs to be some formalization around process. So as an IT pro, it's, it's not acceptable to be just a next, 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 kind of click through the process. You know, if you have been scripting and you don't understand tools like Git, 
And, you know, you don't know what a pull request is and you don't know how to check out files and kind of follow life cycle. You have to know that stuff these days. You're not only going to run into it in your environments, but realistically, we, we go out to the community and you're going to run into that if you interact with Microsoft on one of their various GitHub repos or you, you get into PMP PowerShell and you want to submit an issue, then you, you, you know, have we, to we, we, we've got to understand what it is and what's going out there. So yeah, know how to do a poll and know how to do a push. Know how to create a new branch and go ahead and submit a PR and, and do merges. Oh yeah, and that's something that changed in the last three years, I think. It used to be only devs, but in the last three years, the whole Microsoft has changed where now, even to configure hybrid uh, search, even to configure what was it, the migrating the user profile uh, to the, from FIM to MIM. Yep. It's only posted on GitHub. It's not on the download center. It's only posted on GitHub. So Microsoft has changed where they publish so much more content there that you don't have a choice to learn how to use it. And even for your own stuff, I think it's beneficial. It's the first time at this conference, usually I, I used to do it another way, but now I published all of the content. Even in my flow session, the screenshots to download, all of it is in the GitHub. I have a new repository, Ignite 2018. Everybody goes there. Before, everybody, every time I tried to do it in GitHub, <laughs> everybody complained, yep. not able to do it. And this time I did it, no problem, no question. So I think most IT pros are at that level now where... They can have it, but a lot of people, a lot of them don't want to learn it. And yeah, you know, I do the same thing. And, you know, for anybody who hasn't done it and, you know, you're scared by the terminology, don't be so scared by it. There's tooling like GitHub Desktop, which you can go ahead and interact with. BSTS was recently rebranded into Azure DevOps, everything. Uh, (laughs) But same kind of thing, UI driven. There's a bunch of different tutorials and and ways to interact with these services uh, and and onboard and start having kind of meaningful interactions with them very quickly. Hi, I'm Steve Peshka, and I'm one of the founders at Office365Mon.com. I worked at Microsoft for over 18 years, and one of the most common questions I got is, how do I know what's going on with the health of my Office 365 tenant? When there's a problem with your tenant, you need to know what's going on before your users. We help you understand not only when your tenant goes down, but how well it's performing. When you do have a problem, where do you start looking? Is it your network? Is it your tenant? Is it some feature inside of Office 365? Our network analysis features can pinpoint performance issues and help you figure out where those bottlenecks are. Sign up for a free 90-day trial today at office365mon.com. Stay in the know and stay in control with office365mon.com. Anything else that you can think of? Like, did you have any favorite announcements from this week or anything that kind of stood out to you? Uh, one of the things is lately I've been working a lot with Intranex, so that's my, my, my main focus lately. And Microsoft did some great announcements around that, from the page designs to the new mega menu to all of the personalization, which I think has become the biggest topic in SharePoint is how do we personalize the internet and the digital workplace to be productive yep. for the user. So that my upcoming meetings, my documents, my favorite sites, to having that audiencing or targeting to have different things depending on different people who see it. So I think personalization and where Microsoft is going with it is my favorite feature that, or favorite set of features that got announced this week. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you very much for the time this week, and hopefully we can sit down at some point in the future, once uh, we're all recovered from this thing, <laughs> and we can talk about some of the some of the other stuff that you get into. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for having me, and let's go to Universal. Let's do it. <laughs> if you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.